Great, thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, we're excited to be here with you all today talking about this, um, including because we really look forward to the discussion component of this. We wanted to share with this group what we've been observing, um, both in terms of the data backlogs themselves, but also importantly, what we understand to be the root causes that are driving the data backlogs, um, both because we want to be part of a collective effort to address the symptomatic part of it, the data backlogs themselves, but also be using this opportunity to think together strategically across funders and across partners working together in country uh, to understand why are these happening and what can we do to make sure that in our uh, investments, whether they're COVID-19 focused investments at the moment or our longer term investments, related to various health portfolios or to directly strengthen country digital transformation, we're making these investments in a way that address these root causes um, so that hopefully the next time around we don't see data backlogs um, cropping up either at the um, volume and extent of the, of the data backlogs we're seeing currently um, or you know, as, as a symptom of, of these kinds of technologies being used um, going forward. So let me just start by um, sharing who all is on the line here from USAID. There's been a core team working together on understanding the data backlogs and um, Rob has been a core part of that and will lead the majority of this presentation. We also have Joy Kamenyari, who may be familiar to a number of you, um, who is with the Global Health Bureau's Office of HIV AIDS and detailed to our um, vaccines effort as part of the COVID-19 response. Merrick Schaefer, who I imagine most people know well, who is not able to join today, um, as well as Jacqueline Carlson from our DDI Bureau, um, who is on the line, as is Sherry Haas from our Office of Health Systems. Uh, so you may see them jump in during the discussion period as well. Next slide, please. Great. So I'm just confirming you can, everyone can see the slides. Is that right? Yes. Perfect. Okay. And so far, it's just the cover slide. Okay. And next slide, please. So just to, to set up this um, conversation a bit before I hand it over to Rob to dive in. Again, the objectives of sharing this out today are to um, tell you all what we're seeing, um, in part because we've you know got a line of sight over an, a large number of countries doing related work, and that's important to share out, but also to validate is, is this what others are seeing? Um, is this also others experience? And where there is divergence between what we're about to present and what others are seeing, we really hope you'll bring that to the discussion period so that we can learn together. Um, and then importantly through the, the discussion period, look for opportunities to align on particular next steps that we think are useful, recognizing that this is really a collective action problem. There's a lot that independent funders can do, but of course uh, we can do much more if we're all working in an aligned way toward a common end. Next slide, please. And just briefly, the framing that we bring to this issue of examining data backlogs, and you'll see this in Rob's presentation, um, is in alignment with this overall global shift toward thinking about how we make our digital technology and data systems investments in countries in a way that strengthens country health systems. Um, so moving away from siloed investments in health vertical specific digital technologies and data systems and towards investments that consider overall country capacity to use these digital systems and the data they enable. You'll hear that come up a lot in this presentation and then ideally align directly with national digital health strategies and architecture, uh, considering and using wherever possible global goods. And um, you'll see this approach definitely in the USA digital health vision. Those are the four priorities of our digital health vision, but also in other core documents like the digital investment principles, also known as the principles of donor alignment for digital health. So that's the lens that we bring to this. And I think with that, Rob, I am now going to hand it over to you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Adele. Great. So I'm going to talk, go uh, dive a little deep here, and and I hope you guys will bear with me and find this find this interesting. So 
in a number of conversations in this platform, in sidebar conversations, and in, in, in sort of a lot of discussions, I think that this discussion or, or concept of, of, of data backlogs um, has, has come up. Um, and I think this inspired us um, as we started hearing anecdotal evidence, both across the donor community and then with our um, implementing partners and with our country offices uh, in the field, um, to, to want to understand a little bit deeper and, and get a better sense of, of really what the breadth and, and, and depth of, of these challenges that have started bubbling um, to the surface. Um, so I don't need to, with this group in mind, I don't think we need to belabor the fact that disaggregated and high quality data is critical to COVID-19 vaccine delivery. I think we can probably all start with that, agree to that assumption. I do want to say that specifically what we're talking about here is patient level vaccine administration data. There are, of course, lots of other data flows and data streams that are also vital um, and important, um, uh, whether they be uh, more on the supply chain side or, or what have you. Um, but here, what we're really talking about are vaccine um, administration um, disaggregated data by um, demographic details. So age, sex, healthcare worker status, vaccine type. Um, and, and basically, you know, I, I think. Um, most what we found is that many countries are having uh, significant difficulties accessing this data, which is really hindering um, a, a newfound push um, that's sort of coming from a lot of different directions to, to focus on high risk priority populations, um, particularly as strains of COVID have gotten more and more um, uh, evasive and um, and it's I think getting shots into arms at sort of the 70 plus percent level that was has been targeted is becoming harder and harder to, to see in the immediate term. I think the public health um, pivot, which I do believe makes a lot of sense, is really to increasingly sort of redouble the effort on, on priority populations. But what's really hard is that if you don't have the data on who's being vaccinated, it's really hard to, to plan and target those populations. It's also very hard to track progress and to understand are the programs that are being in place actually working? Are they reaching the populations they're trying to? and to make strategic pivots in, in sort of real or as close to real time as possible. Um, so one thing to note, um, which again, most folks on this line probably have a reasonably good uh, visibility into is that, is that many of the countries have dual uh, pathways for, for recording vaccine um, administration data. There's one rapid path that typically rolls up from sites, oftentimes using calls, text messages, WhatsApp, um, and, and what have you that capture the total doses administered um, this is captured at the site level, so we have geography included in that, but it's just sort of the aggregate number um, of, of doses that it sometimes also has, whether it's first or second dose, but very, very rarely has any additional information on the actual um, patients that have been vaccinated. Then there's a second slower pipeline for disaggregated data, oftentimes capturing at the patient level um, and typically using digital health information systems. For the most part, we're going to be talking about this ladder, this ladder pipeline. Although, because it is different in different countries, um, it, it, this this sort of dichotomy may may not hold in all countries. But it's, I think, a, a useful uh, framework for for thinking about this. Very briefly on our approach um, to gathering this information, um, we sent out a, a questionnaire um, to uh, basically all the USAID missions um, that have received. And by mission is, is sort of our term for country office for those who aren't um, used to the, the USAID um, uh, nomenclature. Um, and and tried to sort and it really just sort of uh, understand this a bit. And I'm going to quickly share that questionnaire just so you understand the questions that, that we're able to answer um, and, and why sort of what we're able to answer and what we're not. Um, we also, of course, then uh, coupled that with uh, in-depth interviews and discussions with with some of uh, sort of the key uh, countries that are getting the most resources, um, and, and then sort of tried to couple that with you know WHO, WHO Afro in particular. I know has done a recent evaluation that we. Um, a rapid assessment that we, we took in and, and, and other sources of data that we, that we had. Um, I think just really quickly what this can tell us, I think this does a pretty good job, at least from the USAID side of, of helping us understand how widespread the issues are um, and where we're investing resources. What it doesn't necessarily tell us, at least not yet, is a lot is more on the really detailed root causes and, and bottlenecks um, that are driving this. And I think that's kind of we'll, to jump ahead. Uh, where I think the most important next step of work is gonna is gonna come, and where I hope as a group we can we can make some some inroads. Very quickly, this is what the questionnaire looked like. I think the one thing I'll, I'll point your attention to as you read through these questions um, is question three: What do you believe is the is the driving the backlogs? As you'll see, we have uh, coded and quantified these responses, but note that 
folks were not asked for a list of different possible uh, drivers and, and, and a tick box. So these were offered um, kind of uh, with an open slate. Um, and, and that's sort of how that, um, that information uh, came. Okay, so what were the top line findings? So we, we've heard back so far from 42 countries. Um, of them, 34 reported backlogs to be an issue. Eight reported uh, there to be no issues um, with, with backlogs. Um, and of those uh, 34, 20 reported it um, or listed it as a critical issue. Um, so I think, you know, this to me really stands out that this is not, this is on the top of, of mind of, of a lot of the folks who are really in, on the ground focusing on implementing into implementing our funding and, and, and working with governments. This is not some sidebar conversation anymore, um, as I feel like it in some ways felt like it was uh, a number of months ago only. Um, three of the country offices reported backlogs of over 10 million records in their countries, it's tend to be larger countries, of course, but still, um, this is just a, a very, very large um, issue. And the average backlog, so if you'll remember, um, one of the questions was, just to jump back, um, do you have a ballpark estimate of the, of the backlog, of the size of the backlog? So 50, only 15 of the 34 countries that reported it being an issue could give us a quantify, some sort of even round number of the quanti quantification of this. And um, of those, the average was um, 4 million records. So um, uh, as a, uh, to give you some context, of those countries, of those 15 countries had averaged 9 million vaccines uh, delivered total. So we're looking at nearly half of administered, uh, administered vaccines have data sitting in some sort of a backlog, which I think is a pretty uh, pretty big wake up call, at least was for us. Um, I will also note that while we're mostly talking about, again, that second pathway of disaggregated patient level data, backlogs of all or aggregated administrative data was were reported in four countries, um, where even the total number of doses administered um, they could not trust the number. They knew that there was a, a pretty significant backlog or, or delay in, in getting that reported up. Um, that was particularly true in the aftermath of, of campaigns where there was sort of a lot of kind of messy data spinning around. And, and I'll talk about that in one second. Actually, I'll just jump to that point. It's the second to last bullet point. One thing that arose um, that we hadn't really, I guess, spent a lot of time talking about before then, at least um, over here, um, was the role that campaigns are playing in driving these backlogs. And in hindsight, it feels very obvious. As, as countries are increasingly pivoting toward campaign approaches um, to reaching um, vulnerable populations and to increasing coverage more generally, the, um, uh, the, it appears that data entry uh, processes, human resources, technology, software, kind of all of the above um, are, are very rarely um, sufficient to meet uh, the scale, particularly of a successful campaign. And then very often, all those things that get get sort of um, uh, built up or or, or 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 ramped up for a campaign, um, folks go back to their sort of normal day jobs within with as a you know in the health um, sector, and are left with a massive state of paper backlog of files without sufficient um, resources to actually enter those. And so we're seeing campaigns as being a, a pretty significant driver of of increases in backlogs. Um, I, I will note just hopping up one one bullet point. Um, one promising thing is that um, 28 of the USAID missions um, uh, that we talked to um, have investments uh, directly going to the data and digital systems associated with uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine coverage, which is to say that, um, again, this is on folks' radar and people are really working right now and investing money, at least um, in country, to, to resolve these, these challenges. And um, most of that funding has only very recently gotten underway. So I'm, I'm personally very hopeful um, that that will um, start to show uh, results and, and bear fruit pr pretty soon. Um, the last thing I will say is that if we were hoping to find some particular silver bullet or, or singular answer, um, I don't think we were quite that naive, but the answer is, of course, that that was not found and that these challenges are multifaceted and, and involve a combination of people, processes, technology and infrastructure, oftentimes interconnected in, in, in how in interacting in, in, in sort of the myriad ways that they do in any um, complex um, uh, program. OK, so how I want to share a little bit now on how these um, these results sort of break down by um, by those categories. So it, it was not 
we decided to sort of take an approach um, that looks at these across, um, again, these sort of four different categories, people, processes, technology, and infrastructure. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on each of them before passing back over to Adele to talk about um, what we're doing and, and, and open up to a discussion. So first, I just want to note that workforce LOE um, was the single most cited issue. Um, that's a very top blue bar there. Um, and you'll also note that at that training of human resources was also uh, cited by very frequently cited um, by about half of those that were reporting issues. Um, next is if you go down to the very bottom bar, that lack of internet um, and, and and electricity and internet with internet being by far the most uh, the predominant sort of infrastructural issue that was flagged um, was cited in over 20 countries. It was the second most commonly cited um, factor. Um, now I will say that I've grayed this out here um, specifically because it's something that I don't think um, at a large scale is something that we're going to solve in the immediate term. And from a USAID perspective, this is not something that we typically invest um, heavily in or, or all that engaged in. Um, uh, now, what's exciting is talking to this broader donor community where other folks may be able to take this on. Um, but, but I think perhaps even more to the point is that um, I think how we're approaching this is viewing this as a constraint to work around rather than necessarily a problem to immediately um, solve. Um, the third point I'll make is that lack of hardware, especially tablets for data entry, was, was very commonly cited. Um, processes and workflows around data management were also either explicit, explicitly noted or implied in 17 countries. And finally, um, I do want to flag that you'll see that the sort of first bar there in the purple color under technology um, talks about offline fact functionality of software. And I raise this because this was one of the leading hypotheses for us coming into this exercise, that the apps that folks were using, the digital applications that were being used for um, data capture we're not performing well offline. We've heard about this um, anecdotally. And so in some ways, I was a little bit surprised. We were a little bit surprised to see that that only came up explicitly in five places. But remember, this was an open-ended question. And I, and I actually think that, um, that much of the internet challenges that are list, listed here are either directly related to the functionality of the applications, or perhaps even more to the point and more importantly, could be mitigated with better software and better offline functionality that, that are designed to work in, the, in that context. So I'm going to do a little bit, go a little bit deeper into each of these um, uh, places um, in, in hopes that this is interesting to folks. So under the people category, some specific challenges uh, that were flagged um, include the overall quality, um, or excuse me, quantity um, of data clerks, um, the staffing surges during campaigns that I talked about, training, especially on digital tools, um, and, and especially in places where, where paper-based registries are the norm. Um, and, and finally, staff remunera uh, remuneration and motivation um, was flagged as, as a sort of um, driver or, or, or of, of backlogs or a, a sort of complication in, in the ability to, to enter data effectively. Um, a quote from one of our respondents is that at an urban level, it is the lack of human resources for data entry. Um, uh, when there is a high demand for vaccination, human resources are in, insufficient um, since they carry out different activities um, corresponding to other programs. And, and I guess we had to cut this short for, for space. There is a second clause here that talks about the issues in the, in the, in the rural areas and, and I, it, it being different. And I think that um, that's also an important point that while there are differences across countries, there are also sort of uh, intra-country differences based on geography and, and uh, implementing partners and programs as well that, that are important to, to keep in mind. Um, on the processes, um, these were probably the hardest ones to analyze because there are Rob, they are so um, variable. Rob. Yes. Sorry, it's Joy. Um, we um, have lost your slide, so would you mind um, resharing, please? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, John was going to take over because we're having an issue um, where we can't see the full slide. It's really just the top of the slide where the content is getting cut off. So we're getting the, the meat of it. Um, but uh, I think at this point, since Sean's attempt to share crashed his computer, we should just continue with you sharing most of the slide. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Well, thank you for flagging that and apologies. Um, I've just been yapping away here. Um, uh, let's see, can you see better now? Yes, we can see. Yes, if you go to present go one slide. Yeah, yeah. We good? Can you go back to people real quick? Absolutely. 
Thank you. And now it's cutting off the bottom. <laughs> so, you know, if you're reading out the text at the bottom, we see the first line of the quote at the bottom, then it's fine. But just keep in mind, um, whereas before people didn't have the header, now they're missing what's at the bottom. Okay. And I, what's funny is when I come over to this screen, so this, I'm, I'm such a novice uh, with, with, um, uh, with Microsoft um, Teams, but when I come over to this side, I actually can't see what you're seeing, which is also um, part of the issue. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep going just because I think the discussion I hope is going to be really interesting. Um, I will, I will try to, we'll share these, of course, I will also, um, we're now on processes, I will effectively just sort of read what's on here rather than referring to it um, for those who can't see which it sounds like is potentially everyone. Um, so under processes, uh, the data management and business processes challenges um, were listed um, as a driver of backlogs in about half the countries that reported issues, again, through the open-ended sort of uh, self-reported and offered um, responses. Um, most countries use um, what we're calling sort of at best a combination of digital and paper tools. So the process of converting paper uh, uh, paper responses into digital platforms varies, but often often involves multiple different people and multiple different transfers of files rather than a single point of entry. The next point is that where data clerks are limited, nurses are oftentimes asked to enter uh, to enter data, and this is oftentimes seems to be after a full day of vaccine administration. Um, and so, you know, you could call that a staffing issue, and this is kind of where the interconnectivity of these different um, challenges comes to play because um, the planning around staffing and the processes of st uh, staffing um, is also a business process consideration beyond just a human resource consideration. And finally, um, uh, process constraints, um, as I mentioned, kind of when I first turned to this slide, are kind of the least understood of the bottlenecks. Um, and I think part of that just has to do with the, the nature of the survey, right? We, um, uh, we didn't ask for incredibly in-depth in, uh, responses, and so some, some folks offered them, some people just listed uh, categorically. Um, and so that's where we're, we're trying to dig in further now. And just to um, bring it uh, into focus, um, one quote from one of our respondents said that a lack of standard operating procedures on how to doc document second doses in particular is creating challenges to data entry clerks, um, and some of the entries are therefore um, being missed. Um, next is technology. Um, which is um, where software related concerns. Um, so we, we subdivided this uh, technology into software and hardware um, uh, concerns. So under software, um, uh, where offline functionality concerns are driving backlogs, uh, there may be uh, reasonably quick solutions. I think we've talked about this as a group before and it's certainly something um, that we're hoping to, um, to see. In particular, improvements to DHIS2 tracker and other similar applications, um, even where not cited, um, we think could have knock-on um, benefits um, and to other issues such as, you know, human resource um, capacity with sort of the better, with better technology and better um, business processes. That's at least our hypothesis. And that many reports of slow applications that include um, more than minimally necessary fields are really slowing down the process. Um, and reverting people back to paper. And I think this is both on the, um, the design of, the, of the, um, the, the, the tool. So how are we capture in the interest of sort of capturing all patient data, are we um, overshooting what's minimally necessary and therefore slowing things down and, and therefore not capturing anything, sort of making perfect the enemy of good? And then I think the other question is, um, is sometimes it's just server issues um, uh, or uh, capacity within the, um, within the application to, uh, to move along quickly from page to page. Um, uh, so uh, to bring this home, um, uh, in this particular country, um, just finished a COVID-19 vaccine campaign, which saw record daily numbers of people turning up for vaccines. But as a result, the system was overwhelmed and so we are currently at a very critical and high priority level in terms of the data backlog. Um, and I think I can I can probably share this. This was this was in Zambia, which did have a really really successful uh, vaccine campaign, and sort of the um, the burden of that of of that success um, uh, came in the form of um, of data um, backlogs. And finally, before I pass back over uh, Adele to you. 
um, is that the infrastructure uh, under infrastructure and enabling environment, and I've already sort of touched on this, so I don't need to go into into much detail, but just to say that um, internet connectivity was cited um, by by over 20 of the of the country um, offices that we talked to, um, but we do still believe, as I mentioned before, that some of these internet constraints at least um, could hopefully be resolved with better offline functionality, because after all, the whole point of offline functionality for apps um, for these applications is to be designed to be to be able to work in these low resource settings where there isn't always available internet connectivity. Um, so Adele, I believe I'm passing back over to you to this, although I'm ha happy to take it if, if you prefer. Yeah, sure. Why don't you go through the next steps part and I'll pick it up after that. Oh, super. OK, um, so we've uh, I think as Adele and as Sean sort of talked about at the beginning, um, we're trying to think about the solutions and approaches uh, in into uh, two interrelated but different ways. One is the clearing of the existing backlogs. And I think uh, to use sort of our um, health metaphor, sort of the addressing of the symptoms. So immediate term solutions that are already underway that I know many, many of you are also investing in is hiring and deploying data clerks, uh, purchasing hardware um, where, where possible, that's obviously obviously can be a, be a challenge, but but um, at least trying to address some of those constraints. Um, training nurses um, uh, and data backlog clerks, so using uh, better training techniques and in some ways uh, digital training opportunities. Um, and at least a couple countries um, are piloting a smart paper technology, um, I think to mixed uh, results and effects. Um, and I think that's obviously very dependent on this, the, the design of, of the paper form to begin with, um, as well as the technology that's being used. And then there are a few other sort of bespoke um, approaches to, to unclogging um, the existing um, uh, backlogs um, that are being, being deployed. Um, and then finally, looking kind of at the root causes. Um, so, you know, we obviously, we can't, we need to address the symptoms. You need to stop the bleeding, so to speak. Um, but um, in order to uh, to try to prevent this from um, uh, some of these things from continuing to to, to snowball and, and spiral, um, I think we'd really love to, and I think this is where this community in particular can be really really helpful, is thinking through solutions uh, to root causes. Um, Sean, I'm I'm a little worried you you may have slightly overpromised. <laughs> um, our uh, I don't think we have any full on solutions yet. I'm, I think this is hopefully a continued discussion. But for those who can't read, I have no idea what you can see on these slides right now. But there are three bullet points here that we talk about. Um, the first is uh, working through, so what we're doing at USAID right now, um, the first is working through our in-country implementing partners um, that are focused on health information systems and digital health to identify specific bottlenecks that are driving backlogs in that country and partnering with their Ministry of Health or other government actors that are relevant um, to improve the data flow quality, et cetera. So in many cases where we have deployed um, resources toward unclogging the backlogs, there is sort of a second part of that project that's focused on documenting and improving um, the backlogs where, um, where they're, uh, excuse me, the bottlenecks to the backlogs um, where they're, they're identified. The second one is we are working with Digital Square to under, undertake a deep dive analysis um, looking at between three and four countries where they're already working very closely on these issues to try to develop sort of actionable um, and generalizable recommendations across each of those categories. So people, processes, and technology um, that can be used in, in some ways as sort of a guide um, a guide for, for countries um, and, and, and a use case for what we're really hoping we can do is organize this sort of from a sort of return on investment perspective. So what is sort of, if you're going to triage this, what's kind of the first most cost effective approach? If that doesn't, if that, you know, solves 30% of the problem, moving your way down um, uh, to, to try to improve the underlying systems and the overall processes. Um, of course, that might be a little bit of a um, wishful thinking that we can get quite that, that granular, but that's really the goal there. And then the last thing is just aggregating the insights and the lessons learned both through Digital Square, through the um, implementing partners in country, through continued conversations, and to try to share that um, out to our country teams and, 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 and up and out to the broader digital uh, donor community through forums like this, um, in hopes that this can not just be a one-time conversation, but, um, but inspire some sort of a working group or some sort of way to, to sort of continue to, to engage more generally. Adele, I will pass it over to you now to lead our discussion. 